Uh, all right, let's go ahead and turn to, what number was that, Debbie? 339. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Hymn number 339. Here we go. Amen. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. On the second. Born of the Spirit with life from above Into God's family divine Justified fully through Calvary's love Oh, what a standing is mine And the transaction so quick was made When as a sinner I came Took of the offer of grace he did proffer. He saved me, oh, praise his dear name. And I down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now I have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe, riches eternal and blessings supernal from his hand I received. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Amen. Remember, today we have a new schedule. We've been working on Wednesday nights, and so I'll go ahead and open in prayer, and then we'll sing one more song, and then we'll turn it over to Pastor Mowers to handle all the prayer requests, and then we'll have a prayer time, and then I'll come up and preach at the end. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the day that you've given to us and for uh, the joy that you've given in our hearts, for all the grace you've given to us through the hurricane and then the cleanup process, all that went on there, uh, to the really, really great service we had on Sunday, all the praises and testimonies. And then even for the week, Father, thank you for just providing for us, letting the power come back on here at church and in our homes and uh, thank you, Lord, that there was no major, major damage that we know of, and you've, you've kept people safe. And so we pray that you're blessed this evening. Uh, Lord, we come together as a church body to, to um, pray for the uh, state of our nation. Uh, Lord, we know a lot is happening these days, but we also pray for our church and all of the uh, stresses, all of the things that our church people are going through, our church itself as a corporate body, as we go through changes uh, here, uh, even right now and the next few weeks and months as people come and go, uh, Lord, we, we just know that your hand is upon all of that and you will walk us through uh, whatever changes may be coming. So help us just to keep our eyes focused on you. We pray that you'd bless our church, bless our people, and may we find comfort in your word. 
and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, please be seated, and let's turn over to, I was thinking of something different there. Yeah, let's go to 434. Nope, not, that's not the one. I'm thinking of, oh, let's just go to 433. Tell it to Jesus. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. On the third, do you fear the gathering clouds of sorrow? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you anxious? What shall be tomorrow? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus, He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother, tell it to Jesus alone. Are you troubled at the thought of dying? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. For Christ's coming kingdom are you sighing? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Before I turn it over to Pastor Mowers, I want to give you a couple quick update as well. We need to have uh, some men help us out today. You notice both signs are missing. We had a great meeting last night in our, in our leader meeting, talking about different things that we need to accomplish. One of those, two of those were those signs. So what we're looking at is to basically take the sign that we were able to salvage. The framework is pretty much destroyed, but the sign it was bent and mangled. I think we can temporarily use that until we can get another sign ordered. So we're going to be able to do that and put that sign, hopefully by Sunday, get that out front. The sign on Highway 29 uh, is not damaged as far as the big white part where the letters go. But the four, four uh, six by six posts uh, have been broken off. And so what we decided to do with that is to go ahead and get some new six by sixes and toggle bolt those, not toggle bolt those, lag bolt or, or bolt those all the way through um, the four that are there and then just put them back in the ground. Stand it back up, put it back in the ground, concrete it in. What we need to do tonight and Sunday Tonight, we would like some guys to help us out. If anybody has a truck that we could use, we're going to take about five or six of the blocks that we have out here in the stack, take it out to the corner, and when the, the sign is very, very heavy because it's hardy plank, and then it's probably three-quarter inch plywood on top of that. It's, it's massive, very heavy. So if we can get a truck with about six or so blocks, and then a bunch of guys go out on our way out of church, then we can pick that sign up and put those blocks under the sign to get it off the ground. I'm afraid that all the grass and the wetness and all that is going to mess up the paint that we've already gotten done. And we'll leave it like that, tilt it up until Sunday. Then on Sunday after church, we'd like to fix that sign. And so we're going to have someone bring a generator, some power tools. We're just going to cut, bolt it in, dig the holes, prop it up, and we're going to need... A bunch of guys to do that. It's very, very heavy. I hope we can pick it up and put it in. So that'll be Sunday. So tonight, anybody with a truck, help us get some blocks, and about five or six guys help us lift it up just enough, and then on Sunday, we'll actually assemble it, put it back up so we can go from there. The sign out on nine uh, Neil right here, uh, we're still working on Anybody wants to help us with that, we just need some two-by-fours uh, to 
screw those back together, get the sign back up, and we can get that done tomorrow, Friday, or Saturday. I'd like to have it up by Sunday, though, so that folks don't look down the street and say, hey, there's a warehouse down there. No, it's a church. We need a sign. And so uh, we'll do that. All right, come on up, bro. Any answers to prayer or praises to start our evening off with? Ron. Answer prayer. Got permits for permits. Amen. Permits for the, the house? Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Amen. I know uh, bureaucracy, right? Pulling permits for this or pulling permits for that. Uh, Miss Teresa. Oh, okay. Okay. Pray for Miss Teresa's granddaughter. She was in uh, the apartments that we've all heard were flooded pretty badly. Uh, pray that the Lord will help her to be able to find a new place to live. For her and the baby. Anybody else? Becca? Amen. I think all of our brains tend to turn to mush if we don't continuously activate them. Uh, Ron. Pray for Miss Scott and Vicky as they, uh, I think Miss Vicky might be in the nursery, um, as they get ready to move to Atlanta. Uh, for those who don't know, um, it is officially final. They have uh, put it on the, uh, out through the web at uh, Navy Fed. Scott has received his promotion. He will be the branch manager of a new branch that is yet to be built. Um, and they will be leaving uh, quite quickly to get those things taken care of. Do you my keys, son? They're on the back seat. Anybody else? Go ahead. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. It's good to... Uh, uh, so uh, he's just praising the Lord that he is uh, able to work uh, as well as go to school and that so far his grades are not suffering and his work is not suffering. So, Pastor Davis. So, uh, Miss Ann, um, her son Roger um, decided it was in her best interest for her to no longer take care of herself. Um, and against her will, he has put her in a nursing home. And we thought it was going to be one in Milton. Um, but he decided one that I guess may be closer to him, which is over in Navarre. Um, and we have tried to get a hold of that nursing home. And so far, they have not been uh, very uh, forthcoming, um, even to tell us her room number or how we can get a hold of her. And at this point, she, she was not answering her cell phone. Um, so just pray for Miss Ann. Um, and, you know, anytime something like that happens, just try to put yourself in that person's shoes when you're praying so you know what to pray for. Um, and I imagine if I were in that situation, um, I'd be scared. Um, so just pray for Miss Ann and, and pray, for some, pray, pray for her son. Her son's name is Roger. Um, and, you know... 
God is so much, uh, so amazing, and he does things in ways that we can't, uh, can't understand oftentimes, at least I can't. Um, so pray that somehow God will allow Roger to come to salvation um, through this unfortunate series of events. Anybody else? All right, with that, we can break up for prayer. Um, we will try to be finished by... Uh, oh, Ra Randy, sorry. Yep. Pray for Miss Susan Haston. Uh, she uh, is in surgery still, last we knew, um, getting her gallbladder out. And I'm going to guess by still in surgery that we expect the surgery to be done. And anytime surgery goes long, that's not a good, good day. Okay. Pastor, Pastor Davis? Pray for uh, Jason and Danny. Uh, Jason's brother, Justin, um, is an officer. Um, and as we've talked about, I can only imagine what it would be like right now to be uh, an officer with all the things going on in America. So pray for him in relation to that. But he's also struggling um, personally and spiritually um, with depression. Anybody else? Go ahead. Josh. So pray for Josh to have wisdom. He is uh, trying to step out of a, a job and into something that may be more career-like um, and that God will help him to know which direction God would have him to go with that. Anybody else? Andy? It's not something you hear every day. His roommate from college's mom was in a motorcycle accident. Oh no. Right. Okay. So Andy's roommate, uh, Andy's roommate's mom got in a motorcycle accident and unfortunately um, there was obviously some, some uh, traumatic brain injury at TBI. So pray, um, because right now she is, uh, they're saying, brain dead. Um, but uh, we know that God can do whatever God wants to do. Um, and, and what a testimony it would be to see God uh, to bring her back the, the way that she was. Anybody else? All right. With that, let's break up for prayer. Um, and at 735, Miss Debbie will come in and play the piano for us. No, she won't. Okay. 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 At 735, I'll come up and pray.
where you were. Jeremiah 15. World. There we go. And in our church, Miss Ann is moving on. Uh, Scott and Vicki. Uh, we need to pray for Josh Mislin to find a job in Pensacola. Want to, don't want to see him leave. <laughs> but that may happen. And things like that uh, take place from time to time. And God is in control of all of that. I heard today that the uh, another thing to pray for is our nation, as Pastor Mowers has prayed. Um, for Black Lives Matter and Antifa and all that going on, there is another reason for them uh, to explode in Kentucky. Uh, if you heard, the um, Attorney General uh, gave the decision from the grand jury regarding the three white police officers uh, that were serving a warrant to a thug um, that was in his apartment. His girlfriend happened to be there, who was not a bad person. She was an EMT. Uh, worked two jobs, everybody loved her, but uh, she and her boyfriend were there in the apartment. They were black. The three white police officers showed up with a warrant, knocked on the door, and they opened the door quickly, and the uh, man, the thug, shot at the police, and so the police opened fire, and in the firefight, the girl, Brianna Taylor, you've probably heard that name, she was killed. And so that was in March. And so all these months later now, they finally decided, all right, what is the ruling? They had charged them with murder, uh, but they all were, at least the two uh, that were the ones that actually shot and killed Breonna Taylor, they were basically acquitted. They, they were acting appropriately in defense. Uh, they were shot at, so they were shooting back. Um, the other police officer has some other issues that he has to deal with, but none of it was murder, and so... Uh, and Kentucky paid the family $12 million already to kind of hold everything back, and yet they're already crying out for tremendous explosion and cities to burn. And all that tonight. So, oops, sorry guys. So that may happen. So we need to pray for uh, our nation uh, for stuff like that to happen. Is it battery problem? Okay. All right, so we're in Jeremiah. And I want to talk to you about Jeremiah for a minute because I want you to know about Jeremiah. Um, Jeremiah is one of the most prominent prophets in the Old Testament, isn't he? It's a huge book. You know, you get in it. By the way, if you're doing your scripture reading, you're in Jeremiah right now. That's one reason why I'm going to give you this verse I'm going to share with you is because I read it. Yeah, come on up. Come on up. And uh, so Jeremiah, one of the most uh, prominent prophets in the Bible, in the Old Testament especially, um, is known for many, many things. Of course, you remember uh, Jesus was compared to Jeremiah. Just switch him out with that. Uh, Jesus was compared to Jeremiah because he was called the weeping prophet because Jeremiah was a weeper, wasn't he? And uh, we have another book written by Jeremiah called Lamentations, and it's just like it sounds. It's a lamenting. Uh, of what's going to take place in Jerusalem in regards to the judgment of God. And so when you read Lamentations, it's not a book to read if you want to get happy. You know what I'm saying? It's a very, very dismal type of book. Um, however, and I should say, uh, even that book can bring joy. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute. So why was Jeremiah in the predicament that he's in? Jeremiah prophesied during the time of Josiah. Josiah was a great king, wasn't he? He was a revivalist, a tremendous revival in Josiah's day. Jerusalem had the best Sabbath they ever had since the days of David, it says. So, uh, uh, or excuse me, Passover. It's amazing what Josiah brought. And here's Jeremiah preaching and prophesying during the times of Josiah, all the way to the very end of Jerusalem when the great Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon would come in, invade the land, take them all away. Jeremiah was part of that. He prophesied for a long time. And he prophesied when things were good. He prophesied when things got bad. But all along, all of his prophecies were terrible. All of his prophecies were bad. 
judgment, 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 judgment. All because of one king. His name was Manasseh. Manasseh reigned for 55 years. He was the longest reigning king of both, well, for the most part, Jerusalem. And he was terrible. Wicked, wicked, wicked king. And because of Manasseh, take a look at chapter 15 and verse 4. I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. So God says the reason why I am going to allow Nebuchadnezzar to come in was because of one man. One man, one king, and what he did. Oh yeah, for decades they were terrible in Jerusalem. The people were terrible, but it was really the one king that's going to be the problem. And God says, we're going to get rid of this guy. So Jeremiah preached God's judgment on this nation. For many, many years, God's patience had run out. Let me show you something. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 7. Just a little study here. Jeremiah 7 and verse 1. Well, let's back up to verse 21. Jeremiah 7, verse 21. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, this is Jeremiah's prophecy, put your burnt offerings unto your sacrifice and eat flesh. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice. I will be your God. You shall be my people and walk in my ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. Now look at verse 24. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and the imagination of their heart and went backward and not forward. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, By the way, that's the entire history of Israel. When they came out of Egypt, to this day, we're talking a thousand something years. Right? What has he said? I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early, sending them, yet they hearken not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but they hardened their neck and did worse than even their fathers. God's had it. God has had it. And so Jeremiah is preaching judgment, 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 judgment on this nation. And I'm going to take you away from your land. Unheard of. How could it possibly be? And so as Jeremiah preached this, what do you think the people are going to do to him? Well, they're not going to like him. Matter of fact, take a look at chapter 38. You're in Jeremiah 15. All of this will make sense in a minute. Hang on with me. Jeremiah 38. As Jeremiah is preaching the judgment of God. As a matter of fact, he keeps preaching. God's going to judge and he's going to take you away. And you know what he tells them to do? Submit. Submit. Don't fight. Do not fight the judgment of God. Do not fight is what he says. Okay, verse 38. Shephatiah, the son of Matan, and Gedaliah, the son of... Chapter 38, verse 1. These guys come. We'll jump down to verse 2. Thus saith the Lord, he that remaineth in this city, this is Jeremiah, he spoke all this to the people, he that remaineth in this city shall die by the sword, by the famine, by the pestilence, by he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans shall live. So if you stay here and you put up a fight, you're going to die. If you go with them into captivity, you shall live. Verse 3, thus saith the Lord, this city shall surely be given to the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Now, verse 4, everybody's upset. How can this guy say, submit? So, verse 4, the princess said to the king, let this man be put to death. Let's kill Jeremiah. We don't like what he's saying. We are going to fight. Verse 5, Zedekiah, the king said, behold, he's in your hand. Go do what you want to do. So, he says, go ahead and take him. So, what do they do? Verse 6, they took Jeremiah, they put him in dungeon of Malchiah, the son of Hamelech, That was in the court of the prison, and they let down Jeremiah with cords in the dungeon. There was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. He's let down into a mud pit all the way up to his waist, it would seem. No food, no water, left to die. Why? Preaching the word. Why? 
taking a stand for God and God's word. Why is this happening to him? Because he was a man of God. So verse 7, Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, which was in the king's house, heard what they had done to Jeremiah, and he basically says, verse 9, My lord, the king, these men have done evil in all they've done to Jeremiah. You can't let them do this to him. And so Zedekiah says in verse 10, uh, take from thence, how many men? 30 men. I want you to take 30 men with you and get Jeremiah, the prophet, out of that dungeon before he dies. Why 30 men? Have you ever tried to pull yourself out of a muckery, muck mire? Usually when I walk through a lot of deep mud, and I've done that before hunting or something like that, I usually use my boot. I lose my boot. It comes right off my foot. Because it's... Can you imagine Jeremiah sunk all in? He says, you need 30 guys. Go take 30 men. And in verse 11, they took old rotten rags. They let them down by cords to Jeremiah. And they say, put those, your arms in there and hold up your arms. And we're going to pull you out. And they do that. And they save his life. Why do they do that to Jeremiah? Because he was a man of God. He was preaching God's word. And he never quit. I give you all of that to simply say this. How do you survive emotionally in times like that? Let's be real. Jeremiah was an old man. He was about to die. And you would think someone in his situation would simply give up. Throw in the towel. Everybody hates me. Why am I doing this? Now we go back to Jeremiah 15. Jeremiah had something in his life that was a source of infinite joy to him. And I would have to say that most of us here tonight have never gone through what Jeremiah went through. Have you ever been put in a pit like that? Have you ever been mocked, spat upon, threatened your life? And then taken to captivity? He does get taken to captivity. He's seen when Babylon it comes in and they beat the men, they kill them. The old men, the women are ripped up. Their children are dashed against stones. He watches all this. That's what Lamentations is about. So I say, when you read Lamentations, he talks about all that. How does this man maintain his sanity when you see that? You see these guys coming back from war. They say, I've seen things in Afghanistan that no man should ever have to see. Limbs torn apart. Heads cut off and blown off because of bombs and shrapnel. That kind of stuff eats at a man or a woman. How do you survive when you see that kind of violence against mankind? You can. And I want to show you the source of infinite joy for you and I. No matter what happens in your life, even if it's just simply a bad day. Something happened and you just, oh, you're just all mad. You're depressed. Let me tell you, the reason why I'm saying all this is because I went through this yesterday. I don't know what it was. I was depressed yesterday. I am not typically a depressed guy, but I was struggling all day yesterday. I just, I, I, I wasn't angry. I was just depressed. I felt like I was just in a bad mood. You know what I mean? Have you ever been that way? Not, not you, right, sis? Never ever been in a bad mood? You just don't want to talk to nobody? It's kind of the way it was. Finally, at about supper time, I sat there, and I'm sitting on the couch, and I told Debbie, I said, Debbie, I'm just struggling. So what's wrong? And I said, I'm just depressed. I don't know what this is. I don't know what's going on with me. She goes, well, I knew something was wrong with you. You ever get that from your spouse? <laughs> and I said, well. And then this verse came to me. This is the source of infinite joy. Look at chapter 15 and verse 16. I guarantee you guys, if you'll get a hold of this, it'll change your life. When I'm depressed, when I struggle, this is how I pull myself out of it. Jeremiah says, thy words were found, and I did eat them. Now stop a minute. Jeremiah is not saying, I physically ate the Bible. Although Ezekiel does do that. If you read Ezekiel, he literally does eat the papyri. John has a vision and he, he's told to eat the book. This is not a physical eating. 
But Jeremiah says, I found your word and I ate those words. The word was unto me, the what everybody, can you see it? The what? Joy and rejoicing of my heart. See, after all that Jeremiah goes through before chapter 15 and after chapter 15, he says, it was the word of God that I ate and it became the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Now let me remind you again what Jeremiah was preaching. Because there was no word of God like we have now. We don't have the Bible. Uh, he didn't have the King James 1611. He didn't have the scriptures like we have. You know what he had? Papyri. That he wrote down. And he had Baruch write some of that down. And He's not physically eating, and what he's saying is, what you told me to say, what you gave to me, the instructions you gave to me, God, I ate them. And what you're telling me became the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Now, what did he tell Jeremiah? Judgment. Judgment. If there could be any encouragement, you think about it. Was he eating... Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Is that, refer is that what he's referring to? Maybe, but most commentators will tell you he's referring to the prophecies that God just gave him. Ju 